Happy Mother's Day. We want to thank all the moms for doing what they do. And we want to thank those people that play the role of the mom as well. And we want to welcome you to Online Church. We hope you enjoy the worship and we hope you enjoy the word. Have a great day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Mom. We love you. Happy Mother's Day. And I love you. You're my only one. Hey mama, this is Chelsea. I'm sending all my love and hugs from Aubrey, Texas. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, mommy, I love you. Bye. Happy Mother's Day, mommy, love you, Danny. Hi mommy, um, happy Mother's Day. I love you really much. Um, yeah. Um, thank you for putting up with me and everything. Thank you for everything that have you done for me. Happy Mother's Day, mom, I love you. Hi mom, happy Mother's Day. It's Missy from Alaska and um, I just wish I could be with you this Mother's Day. I do want you to know that I love you so much. You're just such an amazing lady and I am so blessed to call you mom. Happy Mother's Day mom. We love you mom. Hope you have a good day. Hi mom, it's Ashton, and I'm sending love from your house. Hey mom, it's Canton, sending you love from your bedroom. Happy Mother's Day. Hey mom, this is Braden, sending love from Quad Station. Marley, tell us what you like best about mommy. Hey Mallory? Um, I like what she does for them. Chase? I like she makes Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I just wanted to say with every year I get older, I'm able to appreciate the struggles and effort you put into raising me more and more. Thank you. Hi, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. I love you, and I am so proud of everything that you've accomplished. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Hi mom, it's me Kenzie. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you for putting up with me these nine years, almost ten years now. I love you so much. I'm glad you're here with me. Yeah. I love you mom. Peace out.
is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. Christ alone. The Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. With darkness seen to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In
Help us to see you as you are. Because that is who you are, Lord. That is who you are to us. Help us see you, Lord, as you are. Help us see you. Help us see you as you are, Lord. High and lifted up, bigger than all our pride in the darkness. Oh, you're the God who loves us more. Everything. You have made a way. When there was no way, no more. That is who you are. You are way maker. You are way maker. Miracle worker. Promise keeper. Light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker. Miracle worker. Promise keeper, lie in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Happy Mother's Day. My mom's my hero. I'm going to talk about her just a little bit as I, I always do on Mother's Day. So I'm excited to be able to, uh, to honor her today. We know this is going to be a little different Mother's Day as we have been doing everything a little bit different in, in these days. But as we begin, I, I want to share uh, just a little bit from uh, Max Lucado. And we're in 1 Peter 2. We're going to look at verses 13 through 25, we're going to really focus on verses 18 through 21, as this uh, Mother's Day is a little bit different, so is this Mother's Day sermon, as we we look at an example to follow. One of the things my mother has taught me through the years, in uh, all of what she's dealt with, and uh, again, I'll share that in just a little bit, is just how how to suffer well, how to deal with life, and the hardships, and the pain, and the suffering of life uh, that has come her way, and I, I've never really had to put that into practice yet, as I, I imagine uh, many of you have not, but some of you have in various ways, dealt with various sufferings, and all of us deal with, with different trials and, and troubles from time to time. We've either in the storm or coming out of the storm or about to go into the storm of life. And so God has much to say in His Word about that. And Peter is going to say a lot about that as well. Remember the context of who Peter is writing to? They have this um, tyrant of an emperor named Nero who is uh, doing all sorts of things to cause Christians trouble. He burns the city of Rome. Most people think it was him behind that to clear uh, an area for his palace. And he blames two-thirds of the city of Rome uh, burned, and he blames it on the Christians. And then at that point, he uses dogs to tear Christians apart. And he uses Christians as, as live torches. And all sorts of other persecution take place after that among the emperors as well. They're thrown to the lines. All of that happens and begins really with Nero. So the Christians scatter, and Peter's writing to those folks who are scattered. Peter knows suffering himself, and he knows uh, how to address that with his people who are in crisis as well. I think it's pertinent for our time as we deal with the the pandemic in our day. But as we begin, I just want to share some words from Max Lucado with you. He says this, When the cancer is remission, in remission we say, God is good. When uh, the pay raise comes or the stimulus check, he doesn't say it this way, but I'm adding this, the stimulus check is is in our bank account, we say, God is good. Uh, When the university that we want to get into uh, admits us, or when we're finally through with the semester and we realize we've completed um, another step in our educational process, we say God is good. But do we say God is good when the circumstances are different? And he writes, in the cemetery, as well as the nursery, in the unemployment line, as well as the grocery line, In days of recession, as much as in days of provision, is God always good, even when life isn't? And he writes about a couple in his church who 
experienced all kinds of, of hardships and trials and suffering and pain in a, the year 2014. They had a, a seven-year-old daughter. Their names were Brian and, and Kristen Taylor. And they, a, their seven-year-old daughter was hospitalized uh, for six months and had six different surgeries for a disease of the pancreas. And then Brian, because of all of that, lost his job. And then he lost four members in his family in that same year. And the one surviving uh, family member was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And all sorts of things was just, life was just caving in on them. And she blogs about this. She says, Kristen Taylor, multiple hospital stays with my daughter were exhausting, as you can imagine. But I held faith. Losing Brian's family members one by one until there was only one left who was then diagnosed with stage 4 brain cancer was incomprehensible. But I still held faith. Being hospitalized seven and a half weeks with a placental abruption was terrifying, but I held faith. Their one bright area in that year was that she was pregnant with their fourth child. She said, I held faith that God works for my good. And though I did not necessarily understand the trials, I trusted God's bigger, unseen plan. God and I had a deal. I would endure the trials that came my way as long as He acknowledged my stopping point. He knew where my line had been drawn, and I knew in my heart He would never cross it. He did. I delivered a stillborn baby girl. With my daughter Rebecca still at home on a feeding tube and her future health completely unknown, it was a foregone conclusion that this baby that we so wanted and loved would be saved. She wasn't. My line in the sand was crossed. My one-way deal with God was shattered. Everything changed in that moment. Fear set in. And my faith began to crumble. My safety zone with God was no longer safe. If this could happen in the midst of our greatest struggles, then anything was, game, was fair game. For the first time in my life, anxiety began to overwhelm me. We can relate to that, can't we? some ways, maybe not all the pain and suffering, but we can relate to the fact that she made a deal with God. Most of us have done that. And the fact that he hasn't signed it on his side doesn't mean that we don't believe that we have a certain deal with him. We pledge something like this. I'll be a good and decent person. I'll go to church. I'll, I'll do the things I know to do to be a, a good Christian. And, and in return, God will he'll take care of me. He'll take care of my family. He'll save my child. He'll heal my wife. He'll protect my job. He'll provide. He'll bring me a, a, a good and godly mate, girlfriend, boyfriend. He'll, he'll help us get pregnant or he'll help us have grandkids, all those things. That's, that's only fair, is it not? Yet when God fails to meet our bottom line expectations, we're left spinning like a, a tornado with all sorts of questions. Is God really good? Does God know what's going on? Can He do something about it? Is He really all-powerful, all all-knowing, does God, does God care about our lives, about our pain, about our, our suffering? That's, that's where the people that Peter writes to, and that's maybe where we are. And if we'll be real honest with ourselves and wondering about all of this that's going on in, in our world, that's changing our world. Peter writes uh, to a group of people in the midst of their suffering, and I want you to hear these words, and then, and then we're going to talk about really the source of pain and suffering from this text, and then, in the end, what we do, how we handle that, where do we go? 
So listen to these words from 1 Peter 2, 13. For the Lord's sake, from the New Living Translation, submit to all human authority. Now that's difficult when Nero is the emperor, but Peter writes that anyway. Whether the emperor is head of state or the governors as he is appointed, for the emperor has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. It is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and honor or respect the emperor. He writes his words to slaves, which I'm going to draw from And look at this in verse 18. You who are slaves must submit to your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you. Not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even even if they're cruel. For God is pleased when, conscious of His will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example. And you must follow in His steps. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have returned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Don't miss that part. That's the key part. That's where we go. We return to the the good shepherd, the one who promises, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For He is with us. His rod and His staff, they comfort us. He's with us in the midst of all that we face. So we've got to remember to turn to the shepherd in these days. And that's what we're going to do at the end of this sermon uh, together. As we experience National Day of Prayer today, we're going to end our time uh, praying uh, for the situation, of course. And we're praying also for those folks who are dealing with all sorts of suffering, maybe more so than the folks in this room, maybe more so in the, than the folks in the parking lot on Sunday morning. But mo- no doubt there, there's things that are going on in our world that need to be lifted up to the Father. So let's do that right now, to begin with even, and we'll do it more in just a bit. Father, we thank You for the opportunity to gather and worship, sing praises to Your name. I thank You for this worship team that's here, Lord, that's allowed uh, me an audience to, to preach to tonight, to share these truths with from Your Word. But even more than that, Lord, I thank You for their faithfulness. And Lord, I know even you know, among them, there are things that they've had to deal with that are so difficult, cause a lot of pain, anxiety, Suffering. Lord, I just lift them to you. You know. I lift those folks who are watching this in their living rooms or their bedrooms or wherever they're watching online. I lift that pain to you, Lord. In that situation. Maybe an illness. Maybe a broken relationship. Maybe the loss of a job. Whatever it may be, Father, I lift it to you. And ask you, Lord, as the good shepherd, the guardian of our souls, that you would 
You'd lead us, You'd guide us, You'd protect us, You'd comfort us. Like only You can, Father. The power of Your strong name we pray. Amen. So on your outline you, you're going to have on, on Sunday, and you don't have fully to die, there's going to be a, a four blanks, and we're going to look at four different reasons or four different sources of pain and suffering. And the first one comes from verse 18. You who are slaves must submit to your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. The first source of pain and suffering in our world is that we live in this broken world. There's slavery going on in that ancient day. Now, it's different than the, the slavery that took place in our country in the 17 and 1800s. Most of the, of the world, two-thirds of the world at one time, some historians say, were slaves at one time or another. It had to do more with debt than the conquering of nations, but sometimes it was the conquering of nations that brought about this slavery. So that's a, a brokenness in and of itself. But then it, it talks about the, the masters who are, are cruel. We know we live in this broken world. And we know we live in a broken world because of sin that crept in in, in the fall in Genesis 3. Remember the story of, uh, of Adam and Eve and how they had the run of the Garden of Eden. They could eat of any tree except the tr- that one tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and that was given, that prohibition, that one prohibition, that one rule was given so that they might have a choice to love God. That they would have a, a choice to, to not just be forced into the, the opportunities that, to love God. That, that they would have no other contrary option. But they were given a choice whether to obey and choose to love God or whether not to. And you know, Eve took a, a bite of that forbidden fruit and her wussy husband Adam was there with her and, and a, playing the passive role there. And Satan brought about that brokenness and the yielding to sin. And Peter will write about him later in 1 Peter 5, 8. He's still a roaring lion seeking who he wants to devour in our world. We still live in that same broken world. Jesus speaks of him, Remember? He says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And we live in this broken world where the evil one only wants to steal, kill, and destroy our lives. It seems like, as we look around, he's he's having his day. But that's not the end of the story, is it? Even though we live in the brokenness of this world, we know that God has made great provision. And and part of that provision is is found for us in in the Apostle Paul's writing in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, when he talks about how he has seen all these great things, these wonderful revelations, and God kept him from being conceited by giving him a messenger from Satan to torment him, a thorn in his flesh. And he prays three times in verse 8 that the Lord would take away that thorn. But each time, God responds with these words. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Paul writes, therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. We know we live in this broken world with all these thorns and we all have our own don't we it's not named we don't know specifically what Paul's was and I believe it wasn't named because we all have one and we can all identify and God says to Paul and he says to us there's something better than thorn removal there's something better than pain elimination it's grace It's God doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. It's His unmerited, undeserved favor. And even in the midst of the brokenness, we get glimpses of God's grace. So that's one source of of pain and suffering, that broken world. And that's one 
solution to it. We know that it's God's grace, but we look elsewhere as well. In verse 19, we look at the sin of other, other folks. It's talking about the cruel masters still here. But God is pleased when conscious of His will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Now, all of us have, at one time or another, been the victim or the collateral damage for other people's bad choices. I think about examples of this, like the, the parent sitting at the, the kitchen table discussing the, the child who may have alcohol or drug addiction issues and wondering where they, they've gone wrong. Well, as an adult child, many times, they've made their own choices. And they can't prevent that. Even spending money for rehab over and over and over again, as I've seen repeated, can't solve that problem. Or we think about the, the spouse who has a flirtatious spouse, and it, at some point at work it goes too far, and they, they commit adultery, and they are caught in the, the, as the collateral damage of other people's poor choices, or other people's cruelty, or unjust treatment from other people. We know that happens all the time. The, the drunk driver who plows into your car, the thief who steals from you at, at home or in the, in the business. There's, there's countless examples. I think, of, I think of Joseph. You remember Joseph from Genesis? Chapter 37 through 50 is all about Joseph. You remember the favored son, the, the coat of many colors, how Jacob had bestowed that and had made his brothers jealous. And then uh, to make matters even worse, uh, he was a little pompous and arrogant, telling his brothers that they were going to bow down to him. And that dreamer, here comes that dreamer as he, he went to check on them. And uh, Jacob had sent them. I, I have in my mind that, that Joseph may have been a little tattletale. He was going to spy on his brothers and give a report back to his father about what was going on. And as the dreamer came, his brothers uh, decide, hey, let's get rid of him. And they sit down and have lunch and they're trying to make this decision of whether to kill him or sell him into slavery. And eventually they decide to sell him into slavery. And everything starts going good once he gets to Egypt. But he's left everything. He's lost everything. He's lost his family. He's lost his, his culture. He's lost his language. He's lost his father. All of that. But as he is in that new land, God is with him. And God causes him to prosper. And so he rises to the top of Potiphar's house. And then here it comes again. Not his own doing. It wasn't his own doing that he ended up in Egypt. His brothers did that. And now it's Potiphar's wife who thinks he's smoking hot and can't keep her hands off of him and begs him to come to bed with her over and over and over again. Finally, she sets a trap for him and, and he gra she grabs his cloak and he runs away. He doesn't want to um, sin against God, sin against Potiphar. And she says, when Potiphar comes back, that, that, it, that Hebrew slave tried to rape me and he ends up in prison. All of that happens not because of what he does, not because of his own choices, but because of the choices of his brother or the choices of that woman. Pain and suffering happens because of other folks' choices. We know that full well, and yet God... Reminds us too in verse 20 that sometimes the, the pain and suffering happens because of our own sin. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong or beaten when you sin. Because it's not just other people, is it? It's us. We do stuff. And I'm not going to ask you to testify to that. I'm not going to hear your confessions here. But I, I do know that there are things that happen. We commit sin, lie. Nobody trusts us. Or gossip. And nobody wants to share any information with us. Or, or whatever it might be, we know. And we know that there is consequence of all of that. Pain and suffering comes in because of that. Now, here's the last one I want to share with you. 
the last source of pain and suffering because this is the maybe the hardest one to receive. God allows us to suffer. Now you say, Cal, I, I thought you said God is a God of grace and God is a God of mercy. He, he is, most certainly. So why would He allow me to suffer? That, that doesn't make sense. If, if God is good and I believe He is, then why would He let people suffer? Why does suffering even exist? Why does evil even exist in our world? Well, I can't answer all those questions. Not in the brief time we have, but I think there are some things that that happen, and we've been dealing with those things. And as we look at this passage, it's verse 21 that reminds us, for God called you to, to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in His steps. So here it is. We think if we do good, good things will happen to us. That's our, our theology. If we do bad, bad things will happen to us. If Bad things happen to bad people so that they'll become good people. Right? It's all about being good and bad. But we've lived long enough to know that bad things happen to good people. And sometimes good things happen to bad people. It doesn't work. It's not a one to one correspondence in our world that sin has broken our world. It, it seems like it should work that way, but it doesn't. And think of this. The worst thing that ever happened. The cross happened to the best person who ever lived. Jesus. So why does God allow pain and suffering in our world? Romans 8.29 says that His goal for us is to conform us into the image of His Son. And we would love to display the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. And self-control that the fruit of the Spirit produce. But we want to do that without ever having to, to deal with what He had to deal with. Suffering is part of the process. Why? I think it is. This is my personal thoughts here. Because we're hard-headed. And we're stubborn. And God wants us soft-hearted and submissive. And most of the time, we don't get there till we're flat out of our back and have to look up and have to depend upon the Lord at some level, in some way in our lives. At some point, we've got to say, Lord, I surrender. I can't do this anymore. I can't face this on my own. That's what we do when we come to know Him. That's what we do when we come, uh, become Christians is we say, I know I, I'm a sinner. I, I know I am not God, but I certainly need the One who is. I need the Savior. And I believe Jesus is the Savior. And I choose to follow Him and not focus on uh, the difficulties in our life. So that's one of the the reasons is because God wants us to become more and more like His Son. But the second thing I want you to think about is He does it, as we talked about last week, to test our faith, to purify our faith, but also to see if it's genuine. Is that not what's going on with Job? Remember, Satan and, and God have this conversation, and, and, and Satan says to God, well, of course He's going to praise you. You ha he has all these blessings, but if you turn off the blessing spout, I'm paraphrasing a little here, you turn off the blessing spout, he, he's going to curse you like everyone else. And remember, God removed his, his family, his wealth, even his health. And in the end, Job says, after his wife, Miss Job says, curse God and die, Job says, 
Naked I came into this world and naked I will return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He doesn't curse God because his faith is genuine. And trials and difficulties have, have proven that. And we know that, that fire melts, but we also know that fire forges and, and the fiery trials that we go through that Peter talks about in his letter, which is, is a little bit ironic as during that time Nero was burning Rome, those fiery trials are bringing about the forging of their faith. And it will for us as well. If we continue to pray, God, use this until you remove this in our lives. Oh, could we experience revival in our country as people uh, realize that, that they're not going to live forever, that they have to deal with issues of, of life and death, and they have to deal with issues of, uh, of social distancing and, and, and social gathering together, all the things that are so important to us have been uh, recategorized or, re, or reprioritized. Hopefully, we've placed the things of the Lord to the top of that priority for us. So He tests our faith, and, and then we know also that He uses us, as James tells us, James 1, 2, and 4. To bring about perseverance. Remember? The testing of our faith develops perseverance. Paul says it as well. In his letter to the Romans in Romans 5. It prepares us for what He has for us to come. It strengthens us. And, and so when we think about the heroes of the faith. Noah, I'm quite sure, didn't want to build an ark. Didn't want to put up with all those smelly animals. But God used those days, those days of trial, to bring about the salvation of people. I'm quite sure Shadrach, Meshach, no, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't sign up for the fiery furnace. But they experienced power of God with them in the midst. Daniel, in the lion's den, you can go through a history of folks. Even Peter himself didn't want to deal with all he had to deal with. But God used him to proclaim the message of salvation. And the church exploded through the persecution that was taking place. It scattered all over the Roman Empire. And you and I have come to faith because of what happened in those difficult days. Now how's God going to use this? How is God preparing us for the next step? I hope you'll continue to work that Oikos card like crazy. Pray for those people every day. List. Pray. Invest. Invite. And do what we're doing now. Prepare. Prepare to be better examples of our own faith and, and better, um, more effective witnesses to what Jesus has done. Because you see, He's our example. He suffered in our place. Now I told you, I was going to say a little bit more about my mom to close with. And I'm going to tonight. I, I, my mom is in um, assisted living. Not a good time to be in an assisted living facility in Adler. She's 83 years old, and for, since spring break, for the, all of this COVID um, stuff going on, she's been in her room pretty much the whole time. She can walk and work on her walking down the, the hallway, but for the most part, she, they don't go to the dining room anymore. They don't play games anymore. People can't come in to see them anymore. They have contact with the workers, and the workers only. We can see her through a window. It's a difficult time. My mother has been preparing for a, a difficult time all her life, really. She's been a widow for 49 years. She was a single mom, raised four kids from the ages of seven, five, I was two when my father was killed, and one. 
And, and then after she got those kids raised, um, she had a few years, maybe two or three, four or five years that uh, life was pretty good. And then her mother came to, to live in Hereford and she became the primary caregiver because she had Alzheimer's for the next seven or eight years. Everything was okay after those seven or eight years. And she found out she had Parkinson's disease and for the last 10 or 12 years she's been dealing with the pain and the limited mobility and now she has these hallucinations and can you imagine having hallucinations and being cramped up in the, that, that room all this time. So they're getting worse and worse. But here's what I know about my mom. She has a very low tolerance of physical pain, but a very high tolerance of suffering. Because she depends on the Lord. She has returned long ago to the shepherd of her soul, the guardian of her soul. And thing, I don't understand all of her pain and suffering. I wouldn't even pre- begin to pretend I did. But I know one day, it's all going to be made right. And I know one day, her body's going to be whole again. And I know one day, she'll be reunited with, with my father, my earthly father, and with her Heavenly Father and her earthly Father. And I I can only imagine what that day will be like for her. In the meantime, I'm asking her and I'm asking you and I'm asking all of us who are dealing with various things, let's just keep calling out to God. Keep calling out. He can handle it. He can handle our frustration. He can handle our anxiety. He can handle our disappointment. He can handle it all. And so, as the psalmist uh, says in Psalm 34, 18, if your heart is broken, the message says, you'll find God right there. If you're kicked in the gut, He'll help you catch your breath. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves or rescues those who are crushed in spirit. He cares. That's what Peter's going to tell us. 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety, all your cares upon Him because He cares for us. You know what I tend to do? I cast those things out. It, it's the language of a fisherman, is it not? Peter, the fisherman, writes, cast all your cares upon Him. I do it, and instead of just leaving it there with the Lord like you do when you're, you're catfishing, you know, you watch that bobber until it, and they take the bait and then you... Then you're really in. I, I tend to do it like trout fishing or bass fishing. I, I'll cast those things out and, and, and leave them with the Lord, and then I'll reel them back in. Worry about them some more. Be anxious about them some more. And I'll cast them back out, but I'll reel them back in. Would you cast them out and leave them there? Would you depend on Him as the shepherd? the good shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Let's do that right now. Let's pray together. Father, I pray over this pandemic. Lord, I pray for the world leaders. I pray for President Trump right now. I pray for his advisors, those doctors, and all the decisions that they're making. Father, I pray for truth to win the day. I pray for a squelching of this virus. I pray for truth to be uh, reported. And I pray, Lord, that, that we uh, would look to You in these days as our truth as well. Father, I pray for Governor Abbott. She tries to reopen Texas and the economy and all that's going on around us. Father, I pray that those folks who are really ill where the, the virus is affecting, I pray that You would protect them from harm. and That You would heal their bodies. And I pray, Lord, for the rest of us that we not spread that thing. And 
Lord, I, I pray again that truth and, and, and justice would win out in our day. I pray for Judge Barron. As I prayed uh, already for the others, I pray for, the, for, for wisdom for all of them and for him as they make decisions for Judge Barron as he makes decisions for Yoakum County. I thank you for protecting us from it, Lord. Lord, thank you for um, our sparse population. We very rarely thank you for that. And in in our, our vast land that we don't have to live on top of one another like so many in our world. And Lord, we thank you for providing, protecting. We pray for more. And Lord, we pray for those who suffer, not just from that, but from job loss and all sorts of things that are going on with, with the economy. Lord, we just look to you and ask you, use us. Use us in this situation to help people. And use us even beyond that. Use this situation until you remove it from us. By the power of your strong name we pray. Amen. Amen.